Welcome to another ABC Radio National podcast. For more information, go to abc.net.au slash rn. Now on ABC Radio National, it's time for Street Stories. And tonight, an intriguing tale from Canada. Claude Ranger was a fine jazz drummer who played with his country's best musicians. His burning, no-compromise dedication to music gave him his sweetest moments. But the price he paid in real life was high. First he sold his custom-made drum kit, then he went into rehab. And then seven years ago, he just disappeared into thin air. In Sticks and Stones, Carol Warren pieces together the puzzle that was Claude Ranger. What I can tell you uh, in regards to um, the missing individual, Claude Ranger... Claude Ranger is a, is a gem, is a Canadian treasure, a world-class, universal-class Canadian treasure. We received a complaint in regards to him being missing back in uh, December of 2000. There was something about the monk, you know, the, the kind of the Zen focus of uh, ordinary things that he would find extraordinary. And there was also this great darkness. That initial report came from a, a local area resident that was uh, near to where... Uh, Mr. Ranger lived. Nobody ever played like that before, and nobody will ever play like that again. Since that time, over the past almost seven years, I guess it would be, uh, the file has remained open. We've exhausted every avenue of investigation to determine uh, where Mr. Ranger may be or whether he is um, alive or not. His name comes up all the time. I guess every story needs an ending. And his doesn't have one. Bonsoir et bienvenue à Jazz en Liberté, une heure de jazz présentée tous les vendredis soirs à cette même heure par Radio Canada, des studios de l'Ermitage à Montréal. This is Peter Leach. I'm a jazz guitarist, originally from Montreal, uh, now living in New York. I've been in New York since 1982. Well, I first met Claude Ranger probably the mid-1960s, and I first heard him probably on um, CBC broadcasts from a little hall called the Hermitage in Montreal. The Hermitage Hall in Montreal. Tonight, Jazz en Liberté is featuring Claude Ranger plus nine musicians. And Claude had a band at the time, which consisted of, I think, there were four or five horns, and um, it was a very interesting band. It was all Claude's original writing, very interesting writing. It's kind of ahead of a ahead of its time. up on a gig in a place called the Casa Loma, playing for dancers and strippers. Yeah, I, I seem to remember him being fairly quiet on that job, and he was taking uh, various drugs at, at that time, and he was drinking. He was always a fairly heavy drinker. At the time, there was a diet pill around called Preludin. One night, I noticed he had, like, the big family size bottle of this stuff, uh, like the kind the druggist would use to fill prescriptions on it. I'm Don Thompson, and I played with Claude Ranger oh, dozens of times, hundreds of times in countless different situations. Now, the first time I heard Claude, I was in Montreal, I was working with Sonny Greenwich in a little joint called the Jazz Tech with Lee Gagnon. One night, Lee says to me and Sonny, he says, uh, I'm rehearsing a big band tomorrow, and maybe you guys would like to come and have a listen to it. So the next afternoon, Sonny and I got up early at the crack of 2 p.m., and headed off to this high school where they were rehearsing. And I can remember walking into the school and we're walking down the hall trying to find the room. And I'm all the time I'm thinking how great the rhythm section sounds because the band was just swinging like mad and the rhythm section was really nailing everything. Like every figure and the groove was really strong. So finally, we find the room and we walk in and the rhythm section is Claude Ranger, period.
His ride cymbals were really, I mean, real slanted towards him, almost like they were headphones. And his wrists just used to flow like the head of a cobra. I'm Vito Reza. I'm a drummer. And I was a student of Claude Ranger's back in 72, 73, who also became a great friend. And the bass drum was only 16 inches, and it was cranked, so it was like boom, 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 boom. And you'd hear this thing going on, this tribal thing going on. About my 17th birthday, I had a, my first couple of lessons with him, and then I hung with him till I was like, oh, for maybe, yeah, a year, year and a half. And he would do puzzles, or he would melt crayons, and build sets, like these mini sets, castles and roads, all out of crayon, melted crayon. And that's what he would do. And while you were sitting there on a ride cymbal and pads going bing, 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 bing that's no good. No, not, not, not bad, not bad. Keep going, keep going. And it's like an hour and a half later. Try one more time, and but we never stopped, you know. And I certainly don't play like Claude, but he had such a big impact on me, more from an attitude standpoint and a fearlessness and a no compromising standpoint because compromise is only in the world of popularity. Claude didn't belong in that world. The most amazing blue eyes, like a baby's eyes. I just remember the intensity of when this man would look at you and speak to you. His focus I'm Lynn Darragon. So I'm a singer, songwriter, actress. I met Claude initially in probably the mid-70s, early to mid-70s. He was a, a kind of a wiry, um, I guess he was kind of an average average height, maybe a little shorter. Very, very fit when I knew him. He had a 10-speed bike that he would occasionally say, I'm, I'm going to Kingston now. This was in Toronto, and he'd just drive to Kingston on his bike and back. And I'm sure a lot of people thought he was not fit because he had the cigarette dangling out of his mouth at all times when he was playing. And he had the cigarette that would just hang out the left side of his mouth all the time. In fact, he would light another one while he, you know, when that one burned down. And he didn't inhale cigarettes. He puffed on a cigarette all the time, but he never inhaled. Yeah, that was just part of him. I don't know if he could have played without a cigarette. And I've seen him right in the middle of a solo. Just put down one stick and, and keep playing a solo with one hand while he would be lighting a cigarette. Not just lighting it, but he'd have to find it because he'd have to hit a bag that he carried and put on the stage right by the drums all the time. He usually has some beer and cigarettes in it. And as a matter of fact, there's a track we did called Full Nelson on a concert in Hamilton. And Claude plays what I think is as good as any solo that he played on record at least. And, and believe it or not, when you listen to it, right in the middle of that solo, at some point, he's groping around inside that bag and getting a cigarette out, sticking it in his mouth and lighting it before it can continue the solo. Now, if you can figure out when he did it, I know he did that because I was, I was watching him do it. he's gone. Nobody knows where he is. In the day when he was not drinking and, you know, in his straight time and up till about, I guess, about uh, 11 o'clock at night or so on, if he was playing, he was usually playing at night. He was just the greatest guy to be with. And then there was always one beer. I don't know if it was the fourth or the fifth. It didn't take much. And Suddenly there were, you know, I could see him get very, um, in the club, if somebody looked at him the wrong way, he'd get defensive or, you know, aggressive. And this was not the guy that was the daytime guy. It was a little scary, just a little scary, not knowing who you're talking to all of a sudden. Well, from what I understand, uh, Claude did quite well at the beginning when he first moved to Toronto. He was doing jingles and uh, recordings. He worked with Mo Kaufman. But I understand also that he had a problem being responsible. Sometimes he would be late or not make the gig or, you know, that sort of thing. Which may have been related to his drinking, I don't know. He didn't fit. He never fit. He never fit here. He never belonged here. 
he never felt like he belonged here. It was very hard for him just to exist, just to be here. Um, they were different here. I mean, the truth, the truth is that this, I think, it, it was a, a world phenomenon that uh, the Toronto-based jazz musicians, uh, most of them lived in Rosedale. And most of them were doing 30, 40, 50 r recording sessions a week. I'm talking about jingles and commercials and that kind of stuff. They were wealthy. The studio attitude where you play it this way every single time, you know, that's exactly the opposite of closed whole approach to life. You know, I've been in the studio countless times where they, you'll do a take and then the voice will come over the, the phones and will say, uh, drummer in bar 11, could you give us a little bit of a fill in the bar 12? And then we'll do another take and then they'll say, a uh, drummer, that fill was okay, but could it just be a little bit more intense? And like Claude, that's just not him. He could have done it, but he would have hated it. He was living in an apartment, you know, above a store. It was very, very Spartan, you know, a mattress on the floor. One ghetto blaster kind of thing. That was the only sound system. He had his uh, Fender Rhodes. Then he had his drum kit in front of the bay window. And a rocking chair. And everything painted white. He painted everything white. And But it was very neat. And he liked to... Um, he loved to iron. <laughs> he was always ironing shirts. My name is Buff Allen. I'm a jazz drummer based out of the Vancouver area. I've been playing professionally now for 40 years. I became aware of Claude when I was still living in Vancouver before I moved to Toronto. I, I moved from here for eight years. Uh, soon after I got to Toronto, I, I really wanted to take some lessons from Claude. and I'd find him somewhere. He didn't have a phone, by the way. So I'd find him somewhere on the street or in a club, and I'd ask him for a lesson. He'd say, yeah, yeah, get a hold of me. Well, he didn't have a phone. And the next time I'd see him, he'd look at me and say, uh, you don't need them. So I finally got the idea that he didn't want to teach me. And so I got my lessons by watching him play whenever I could. Politically, he was really, really bad. He was really good when he loved you. He would just speak through that love that he had for you. That was that. And he would always bump you up a little bit, even if you didn't play that well, but he loved you because he cared enough about you to want you to play great. But in his own personal life, in relationship to dealing with other musicians and how to get work and how to network, it was really, really tough. There was the chosen few people who didn't have any problems with him. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly jaunt across Jazz Radio Canada. We're going to listen to Ed Bickert on guitar, Neil Swenson on bass, Claude Ranger on battery, Don Thompson on piano, and the man with the golden flute, Mo Kaufman. Claude's uh, association with Mo Kaufman's band came to an end in Australia. They were filming something with uh, James Galway, you know, the Irish classical flute player. There was sort of a flute duel between Mo and James, and Claude was not digging it, so he stopped playing and crossed his arms as he would. If, if he didn't storm off the stage, he'd cross his arms to show his displeasure, and uh, Mo realized the drums had stopped, and he turned around and was saying to play, and Claude shook his head, and this got into a raging argument between the two, to finally the, the F word with both of them, and all being taped by uh, Australian television. So I guess somewhere in a, in a vault at, in Sydney, there's a, that tape. I'd love to see it. <laughs> if it wasn't exactly the kind of music he wanted to play, it wouldn't matter who it was. He'd just say no, which is fantastic. You know, I mean, not many people ever do that. Because most guys were really concerned. They said, well, man, i got a couple of kids here. i got to make some money. Get a call. I'll do it. I'll do it. What do you want? When do you want me there? I'll do anything. And he just wouldn't do that. He couldn't deal with the world. He couldn't deal with bank accounts and dentistry. And he was totally in his own realm. Whether the bills were paid or not paid, you know, that didn't matter. I couldn't be the one to be the mother or to take care of him. And he really needed taken care of. When 
nothing has been ruled out because there really are no definitive answers other than based on our information when he was last seen and where that was and by whom. Uh, anything since then has shown nothing. I have heard rumors that he's living with some woman up near Kamloops. Nothing's been proven, nothing's been discovered. It's just, these are just rumors. Any number of things. Uh, it could be foul play. It could be he simply does not want to be found and has chosen to start a new life somewhere else, which is not uh, uh, illegal. I heard that he was um, you know, kind of on the street the last I heard of him. He's not being sought because of any illegal activity. He's being sought because he's been reported missing by people that, that uh, have a concern for his well-being. My name is Cindy Karnick. My mom, Allie Karnick, was Claude's partner for quite a number of years, and we all lived together on... Silver Birch Avenue in Toronto. My my mom met Claude at a gig and they got talking and uh, quite an interest in one another developed quite quickly and it wasn't long before my mom thought it was absolutely ridiculous that he was living in this one room. He was living in a very tiny one room apartment uh, because Claude, being so focused on his art and music, didn't have the business side working to the best of uh, <laughs> his ability and certainly not to his best advantage. And my mom didn't seem to think that made a lot of sense and uh, decided that he should really come and live with us as soon as possible. And he eventually agreed because... Claude was a very attractive man. Um, and there was, as with most musicians, a certain sexuality that came from his uh, musical talent, the way he held himself uh, physically. Uh, there was always that sense of mystery about Claude as well. He was very shy, and whenever he you know, created something or, or uh, you know, blew, blew somebody away with a performance, the satisfaction from it might have lasted 10 seconds before it was on to, you know, this is, it was never good enough. There was always more to be done. Okay, we take you now to the club Bourbon Street in Toronto, which is Toronto's oldest existing jazz club, I believe. Bourbon Street sounds like a fairly mainstream home of jazz. It wasn't this evening when Claude Ranger brought his gang in. Claude Ranger on drums, Dick Felix on bass. And I think Claude wound up working with the young guys a lot. And like the bands he had, he always had the younger guys in it. And Spanish Paperboy. He would be more convinced by hearing a young kid play because he could, he could smell the sweat. And he said he'd say things like, uh, oh, he's very dirty. Oh, he sounded very dirty, eh? Oh, angry, angry. He'd pick out those kinds of things, not, oh, wow, man, what a man, he's got a great left hand. He's, you know, really responsive and his bass drum sound. Boy, he's got a fast foot. No, it was never that. It was always about something emotional. The young guys have an open mind. They would do anything he said, you know. They would rehearse a couple of days a week. He had his students, of course, but he went, uh, played in most of the jazz festivals, not only in the city, but uh, nationally. Uh, my mom, for the most part, arranged a lot of those uh, opportunities. And... Um, he and my mom, that's one thing I have to say. He was probably more transparent and open with her and to her than probably anyone else 
ever because she understood him, she accepted him. You know, his late night eating, his, his hours, his self-esteem issues, the drinking, drugs. Not what happened towards the end, you know, of their relationship is it did start breaking down. And I think there was... Uh, a lot less willingness to be productive and a lot more uh, a lot more drinking and I guess he needed a change and um, shortly thereafter he met uh, another woman when Claude moved out to Vancouver in the oh, mid to late mid to later 80s uh, again like when he arrived in Toronto his reputation preceded him the more professional, more mature musicians that were around town, of course, knew all about him and were just thrilled that they, he was here. Uh, the younger ones would soon learn. When when Claude moved to Vancouver, I think about that time, he really wasn't doing very much here. And I just think he wanted to go somewhere different. I saw him after he'd been there and he was having a ball. He had a bicycle, he was riding around and he had a band again of a bunch of young guys out there, and everything seemed to be good, and so I was very happy for him. Claude got a, as much work as he wanted. He was never one to hustle. He was never one to want to make a lot of money. In fact, he, he always survived on almost nothing. I mentioned to um, a friend of mine once uh, where a lot of European countries will support their important artists, such as Finland did with Sibelius, or uh, I remember Italy did the same thing with uh, Michelangeli, the fabulous but eccentric classical pianist who lived in a cave outside of Rome. And I always said that we should, you know, Canada should do this for somebody like Claude, and my friend turned and said, it wouldn't cost much. <laughs> He and my mom kept in touch for a short while. And then we heard that things had not gone well and that he, I don't know, had pretty much returned to the same condition and situation that he was in much when my mom and he got first got together and financially was not doing well and physically wasn't doing well and was abusing probably alcohol and possibly drugs, I don't know. When my mom died, I wasn't able to reach Claude in any way. Um, there was no way really to find him. My name is Ivan Bamford. Uh, I'm a drummer in Montreal. And I bought Claude Ranger's drums uh, back in Vancouver in August 1996. Oh, pretty special, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I'm a really lucky guy to have fallen upon those. He... Um, he, he, when I met him and he mentioned selling them, he was wanting to sell them for $900 because he desperately needed dental work. And the shells alone, the, sh the wood of the drums was worth $3,000. When I was 15, was I saw Claude play uh, during the jazz festival. And it was five years later that I saw him standing next to a stage in the, during the jazz festival that I approached him and just mentioned that I had seen him playing. And uh, we started talking and we became friends after that. A month, I'll pay $1,500 for them. And that made him really happy. And of course, I was really happy too. I felt it was the least I could do. Uh, well, it was mostly after buying the drums that I clued in to how famous he was. He was always selling stuff. <laughs> Usually when he sold them, it was because he was going to get something else. Now, if he actually sold a set of drums and didn't get another set of drums, that's a huge thing. It's almost like he's given up or something. By the late 90s, he was hardly playing at all, and somebody dragged him over to Victoria to do a jazz gig. A friend of mine was on the job and said it was really rusty at first, and by the end of the night he was back to himself, just fabulous, intense, roaring playing. But it got rarer and rarer. He, he didn't seem to want to play much anymore. He would really come to terms with everything in his life, as far as I could see. He had gotten a little bit frail by that time. Um, yeah, he had stopped drinking, and uh, his body was 
had taken a toll after decades of, of abuse. In dealing with his manic depression, he went to a some sort of government facility up in Aldergrove. Uh, it's in the Fraser Valley, just east of Vancouver. Um, sort of a group home. Very, very sparse apartment. He just had a TV uh, mattress and some incense. That was about it. We, we spent uh, sometimes all afternoons or late at night talking about talking about uh, you know his, his, his career, his life. His best night, he felt, was with Dewey Redmond in Saskatchewan. And so he talked about that night, really saying that he had uh, reached the highest point that night. time I saw Claude, a few days before that I had played a concert for Don Thompson up in Powell River, his hometown, and Don had uh, just come back from Montreal playing a concert there for Dewey yeah, Redman, the late Toronto, uh, saxophone player. And we were on Dewey a break one night, and Dewey had this, a good young drummer from New York, a guy called Matt Wilson. Dewey, we were just sitting in the band room, and Dewey looks over to me and says, whatever happened to that Claude Ranger? I said, oh, you mean Claude? He's moved out to Vancouver. At this point, Claude was living out there, and, and as far as I know, he was doing pretty well. I told him a little bit what he was doing out here, so and the young said, hot drummer who was on the gig, I forget who it was. He said to me, who's that you talking about? came over to ask who they were talking about, and Don said, we're uh, discussing one of Canada's greatest jazz drummers. And I said, oh, Claude Ranger, he's probably the best drummer in Canada. Dewey interrupted him and said, make that the world. Dewey looks at me and he says, make that the world. So I said this to Claude, I told him that story and he pretended to be a little embarrassed but I, he said oh that Dewey but I could see he was he was really pleased Artists like Claude, artists that are true artists, they just can't operate on the same plane and in the same way as other people. And, and you do, you need a, a certain acceptance and a certain level of understanding. And if you don't have that, then the world fails them and, they, and, and then they wind up in the condition and situation that Claude's in and that a lot of other artists are in. And how sad is that? doesn't appear to be any evidence of foul play uh, at this point. Uh, he does, uh, at the time, appear to have had some personal issues that he was dealing with. The last I heard is that he walked out of the facility and left what few belongings he had. Didn't take anything, didn't tell anybody he was going anywhere. He just walked out and disappeared. A lot of people have been interviewed and looked at and... Uh, a lot of different agencies contacted to, to see uh, whether Mr. Ranger has had any involvement with them, all of which um, have proved to be negative. I'd love to see him again. I keep hoping, you know, we all keep hoping that we're going to hear that he's back and that he's, or not back. I don't ever expect he'll play again, but I'd just like to know that he's around and okay. You know, it'd be, it'd be great to know that he's okay wherever he is. Sticks and Stones was produced by Karen Wells for the CBC. It's part of our international program exchange, Crossing Boundaries. And if you'd like to read more about Claude Ranger, head to the Street Stories website. You've been listening to another ABC Radio National podcast. ABC Radio National 
on air and online, with many of our programs available as podcasts or MP3 downloads. All the details at abc.net.au slash rn slash podcast. Thank you.